This this is Ancient Political Philosophy, Friday, October 23rd, uh, 2020. You should have 3.5 um, uh, things in front of you. Uh, one is the notes for today, which say, Notes, Friday, October 23rd, 2020. I've already sent you out an email. I'm postponing. I'm pushing back um, uh, uh, the due dates for PRQs, and in fact, the lecture schedule, because I've decided to expand uh, today's lecture and discuss a general um, uh, introduction to Aristotelian uh, thought uh, as it bears on the ethics and politics and in some ways the whole nature of Aristotelian, the Aristotelian system. And as I mentioned in the email, which I think will provide a, a nice transition from Plato to Aristotle, especially meditating on some important questions, uh, and of all things, of writing style, which you'll see, you should also have the key terms of politics and ethics in Greek, Latin, and Central to the Republic, the ethics, and the politics. I'm going to do a little vocabulary lesson that will help with um, um, uh, understanding uh, key terms, both in Plato uh, and Aristotle. I probably could have done this at the beginning of the Republic, but it's important to keep you tense and anticipating more knowledge. Um, uh, but then the other thing is you should have the delightful cone. Now, I have to say this diagram uh, is my own invention. It comes from years of trying to explain, understand myself, and also explain to undergraduates uh, the nature of Aristotelian universe. This, by the way, uh, uh, this cone, um, which is the, er the uh, universe according to Aristotle, is in some ways Aristotle's version, I think, of uh, of the divided line in the Republic. Now, uh, uh, there's no specific text that we're using in the Ethics or Politics, which which uh, to which this refers. This is a this is based upon the Ethics and Politics, but also in some ways Aristotle's understanding of the metaphysics and the physics, his natural teachings too. So, um, uh, more about this later. Um, I want to start by uh, if you're looking at the notes. Uh, so, by the way, today's lecture will be primarily introductory to Aristotle, and then Monday's lecture will then uh, talk more specifically uh, about books one and two of the Ethics, and uh, and then um, uh, and then so the PRQs uh, for books one and two will be due on Wednesday, and for two and three will be due on Friday. So I'm pushing everything back a day, uh, primarily so that I can go on and on and on and show you how brilliant and learned I am. Um, I want to start out. Uh, so if you're looking at the notes. Here's what they say. Uh, an interesting passage that unites Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and happiness and tyranny, and why you need the ethics, uh, the things that pertain to human character. Sachs says interesting translation of athike, the Greek name of this. We'll talk more about this vocabulary stuff in a minute. Um, and uh, and its subject material to both proceed and complete the politics. If you've read book one of the, politic, of the ethics, you know that Aristotle considers the ethics to be part one of a larger work called politics. Um, so strictly speaking, um, uh, the, the ethics and politics form a single work called the politics. And since you'll see, as we're going to talk more about the vocabulary in a minute, the ethics is about individual happiness. You could say, well, why do we need to know about individual happiness if we're talking about the political world? Because uh, in the same way uh, that, if, remember, the Aristotelian and Platonic and Socratic view of the Universe, and that's why these are the three great first political philosophers in the Western world, is because um, uh, uh, the separation between the public and the private, which is at the foundation of modern life, modern political life, and personal life, in some ways doesn't exist. It didn't exist in politics prior to 1776. There was no nation uh, that existed in practice that separated the private and public realm. Although you'll see Aristotle's political teaching does substantially depend on a difference between them and attempt to cordon off. Um, in some ways, it's, it's ironic. Aristotle both includes the private realm of private happiness within the political, but one big difference between the Republic and its perfect city and, uh, and Aristotle's not-so-bad city is Aristotle's attempt to actually find a dignity for the private life in a way that Plato completely erases as you saw in the subsumption and not complete erasure, but the subsumption of the erotic and personal into the political in the perfected city of Book Five of the Republic. Well, Aristotle shares the same idea that the political includes the personal and the private, 
But also, as you'll see, a big difference is Aristotle tries to preserve the dignity of the private erotic, to preserve the dignity of the private family and private property as absolutely necessary to human happiness, as you'll see in book two of the politics when we get to that. So meanwhile, uh, let me just, at, at this point, since we're talking, these great thinkers, all four of them in the class this term, I'll take off these glasses because I can't see myself talking to myself in my video, but I'll need them to read from the ethics. Um, so I'll put them back on and immediately. Um, uh, the, the, uh, oh, my yarmulke is falling off. That always happens when you're going bald. Um, anyway, uh, where were we? So excited. Um, oh, um, so even though there are profound differences between Plato and Socrates, I think, I might get to some of those today, and come, but also between profound differences, uh, between uh, Plato and Aristotle, and differences between, in some ways, Plato, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the Greek founders of political philosophy, and Cicero, the, the Roman inheritor and preserver of that uh, tradition. Um, nevertheless, they are in the same philosophic universe. Um, and what that means is, and why they're in a different philosophic and political universe than the modern political philosophers, beginning with Machiavelli, Hobbes, Spinoza, Descartes, Locke, Rousseau, uh, Hegel, Kant, Marx, Nietzsche, and the moderns, and us in our politics, uh, and uh, and to some degree last year in ancient political in modern political philosophy, and to some degree in gender and politics, I, I raise this question. Um, what? Let me just step back for a second and make this broad statement. Um, part of the great debate. Part of the great issue, I should say, in political and human life is to what extent are our moral and political lives grounded in something outside of human life, outside of the conventional world of political authority and culture? And, and you could say that uh, modernity, at least early modernity, is an attempt to reject in this if you remember from modern political philosophy this is book uh, chapter 15 of machiavelli's prince which he says i'm starting out with politics and i'm rejecting the old well what was machiavelli rejecting in chapter 15 of the prince uh the kingdoms and principalities uh imagined by the ancients and i think that includes the republics of plato and aristotle um and the Bible, for that matter. So on one level, even though the biblical universe and the Aristotelian, Platonic, Socratic universe are quite different from each other, they share uh, the idea that our internal, uh, our t internal moral and political orientations in the human world, in our human identity, are based upon something outside of that. In the Bible, it's God, and in Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and Cicero, it's nature, as we'll see. And to some degree, uh, uh, both political philosophy in the modern world um, uh, eventually separates uh, human identity from anything external to it. And the radicalizations of modern identity and Marxism and, and, and Nietzschean and post-Nietzschean existentialism, you get the idea that human identity is a, is a completely self-contained entity and owes nothing to the outside or larger universe. That, that's most dramatically uh, expressed in Nietzsche's expression, God is dead. Doesn't mean that God went on an anorexic diet and grew weak and died. When Nietzsche says God is dead, Nietzsche means both the Bible and Plato and Aristotle and Cicero are dead. That is to say, there's nothing external to human consciousness that guides the internal needs of human consciousness. You, uh, uh, Nietzsche says, in his great work, Also Sprach Zarathustra, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, um, and in his other works, that the, the universe is an abyss. Uh, it provides no support. It's a black, chaotic nothing. And therefore, human beings have to create their own moral uh, and political universe. Well, that's the modern world in some ways, as it's developed both philosophically and in some ways culturally and politically. I've suggested this. That, it, that one of the great problems uh, in the modern world, as, as both American politics unfolds, as modern political philosophy unfolds, and as, as the political world of the West unfolds, is at the heart of it is this nagging nihilism, that the universe supplies nothing by the way of organizing or supportive information or help. 
to our inner, our deepest innest, inner personal and cultural and political needs. Now, again, if I'm right about that, and, and I suggested some of this in the gender and politics class, and, and since I got so far behind in the modern political philosophy class, we didn't fully get to this. But again, if you say uh, the external, there's no objective support, uh, either in God, because either the Bible and all the religious literature of humanity are fables, they're just the Santa Claus stories, uh, which Plato thinks, by the way, I think, and Aristotle think of religious traditions. Um, but but either because, again, the, the divine stories in the East and West are all fables, and or the nature that Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Cicero see is a fiction. Uh, if you say that, and therefore in our personal lives, in our cultural lives, in our political lives, there's no guidance to be had uh, by considering the universe around us. Well, that Nietzsche kind of knows the nihilistic temptations or implications of that, but asks us to buck up and, and just invent our own morals and our own politics. Fine, the Nazis heard that lesson and they invented their own politics. And the problem is, if you say that the there's no objective guidance for our identities, then then when it comes to your personal universe, it's, it's uh, completely free for all. And when it comes to the political universe, if you say there's no way to distinguish objectively between Nazism and American constitutionalism, then all you do is celebrate the power that dominates in each political universe and culture. And as we, as modern life unfolds, this nagging nihilism that uh, that de-anchors human life from the supporting and surrounding universe may prove to be an extremely product problematic fate for humanity. Um, but who knows? We're still in the middle of that experiment. Meanwhile, in this class, we're recovering the ancient views of these things in which there is an objective anchoring. It's not biblical, as I already suggested with the Republic, um, and there's no God here, but there is an order. And, and so in some ways, even though Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Cicero don't believe in the gods of Athens or Greece or Rome or the Bible, they do believe there is a divine order without a God. I, I know that's problematic, but but as you'll see, when it's, uh, and I think that's evident from the Republic, as we saw in the deepest parts of the Republic in books six and seven, but uh, uh, but I want to make some of these things clear. So let's start out. So so even though there are profound differences, as you'll see as we unfold Aristotle and even Cicero, nevertheless, all four of these great authors ex inhabit the same uh, universe in the sense that uh, even though they have profoundly different views of philosophy and political philosophy and their politics are different, <coughs> nevertheless, they think there is guidance to be had in the rational contemplation of the universe around us. So uh, this issue raises the great question in human life. The great question then, the great question now, the great question that is unfolding in all of our lives, yours and mine personally and collectively and globally. So, um, but here's the nice uh, uh, connection between um, uh, Socrates and Plato on the one hand and Aristotle on the other that unites in some ways, and it's in, found in Book 10. Uh, I'm just going to, and I refer to it, and that is the question of tyranny and, and blaming or, or the, the fault of tyranny or the problem of tyranny is linked with uh, a kind, kind of a misunderstanding of human happiness. That's what we saw culminating in Book 9 of the Republic, and in some ways both in Book 10 of the Ethics and um, and in uh, book three of the politics uh, and in other parts of the politics where Aristotle lays out his understanding of tyranny, we'll see why it's destructive of human happiness in life, both for the tyrant and for the political and social world around him. So this is on page 190. And the marginal comment is, is uh, the numbers, remember, uh, this is from the Stephanus numbering system that started with the Euthyphro, actually, and goes through all the different uh, Platonic and Aristotelian writings, and the marginal numbers refer to the, the page numbers in the Stephanus edition of Plato and Aristotle. So at 1176 um, B15, roughly, in the middle of page um, 190 of the Sachs translation, but so are the pleasures that come from playing, and since they are not chosen for the sake of any other things, people are harmed by them more they are benefited, since they neglect their bodies and their property. But many of those who are considered happy escape into pastimes of this sort, 
and for this reason people who are charming in such ways of passing the time are highly regarded around tyrants. For they display themselves to the latter as pleasing to those th in those things which they aim at, the tyrants aim at. And the people tyrants need are of this sort. It seems then that these pastimes are conducive to happiness because those who are in power spend their leisure in them. But perhaps such people are no indication, since virtue does not consist in having power, nor does intel intelligence, and the activities that are of serious worth come from these. Uh, uh, that is to say, virtue and intelligence, which is the whole theme of the ethics. And the activities that are of serious worth, blah, 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 blah. Um, and if those people run off to bodily pleasures because they have no taste for pleasure that is pure and suited to people who are free, one ought not to believe on that account that those pleasures are more worthy of choice. So, uh, this goes back to this old hedonism question. You're going to talk a lot about pleasure in the ethics, and and it wouldn't be an understatement to say that what Aristotle's trying to do is to teach you how to rank pleasures, and that while the pleasure is not the good, the good is pleasurable, and in some ways pleasure is nature's way of pointing us upwards uh, towards our spiritual and um, intellectual perfections. So um, the reason that tyrants look happy is because they identify, as do many masses of humanity, that the pleasures of the body and the entertainments, the poetic entertainments that come from those things, are the chief human happinesses. And if that's the case, as Plato points out in Book 9, eight, nine and 10 of the Republic, uh, that, that in some ways, that, that tyrants can think that that's what happiness is because the poets teach us that's what happiness is. But perhaps happiness consists of something deeper and more profound and rooted in our minds and our intellects when brought to perfection by philosophy. All right. So um, let's uh, 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 I want to turn now Roman numeral two in the notes to some key terms in uh, uh, vocabulary terms in politics and ethics. Uh, and just I want to spend about 10, 15 minutes just running down them and introducing this. And we'll probably refer back to this both when we move through the ethics and the politics. First of all, polis, the Greek word for city, nation, country. Well, what Athens and Sparta and all of the 130-some Greek city-states, we call them city-states, remember those were independent countries about the size of Liechtenstein, or actually Athens in its total territory was about the size of Greenville-Spartanburg. Um, and uh, But those were the independent countries. The sovereign political unit is what the polis is, the city. Better translated as city, but in our, our America is our polis. The United States of America is our polis. Um, the Republic of France is France's polis. It's not like just like Indianapolis. Um, uh, so the, this is the key concrete term in Greek political thought, um, that uh, out of which all Aristotle and for that matter, Plato's political teaching emerges. Um, the, the, uh, uh, the Latin word for this is kivitas, which are and our whole Latin English vocabulary, like citizen and civic, comes from Latin. Polis and political comes from the Greek polis. Politos is the citizen, the member of the political community. And, and the next term, politike, is what Sachs translates as politics, can be translated as political science. And for this reason, politics, it's politike. So politike, politike is the activity of the city as a collectivity and also the individual citizens who participate in politics. Uh, so, and, so you, and again, you're going to see this term, the EK ending, the X ending in, because EK in Greek is you're going to see this, this suffix. Let me just read what I said here. Um, uh, politike is the name of Aristotle's politics. The EK ending in Greek is the root of our X ending through Latin ika, like politike in Greek became politika, Mathematike in Greek became uh, 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 mathematica in Latin, and then that was just transported. Actually, our word mathematics, politics, statistics, uh, uh, ethics, it's that same Greek suffix. And what did that ek ending mean? It meant the art of conducting that particular activity to its best, typically based on systematic knowledge and science of the phenomenon. So politics can be both the art of ruling, the politics, the activity of the actual polices and politoi, the citizens and, and cities, and or the science 
uh, uh, of the city, political science, like Mathematike. So that EK ending is both a, a, an art and a science. And if you think about it, you have to learn the principles of something in order to master the, the conduct of that thing. So um, uh, in other translations of the ethics and the politics, politike is translated sometimes as political science, etc. Sex in the politics, in the ethics, translates it as politics, and that is the Greek word for politike, the politics of Aristotle. But understand, what Athens does, what what Trump or Biden does, what Nancy Pelosi does, what you and I do when you go in to vote and, and shout at each other with our political opinions is politike. But what Plato and Aristotle are doing in writing these philosophic works is also politike. So, and the idea, as I suggested um, uh, in some of my comments on the Republic, the presumption is, is the more you know about this stuff, the better you can do it. So both Plato and Aristotle especially are laying out a kind of science of politics in, in order to improve the art of politics. Whether or not that works, that's up to you. The name of this book is Ethike, uh, the ethics, literally. As Sachs translates it in his preface, uh, the things pertaining to character. Um, the root, so, so what the ethics is about is private happiness based on the idea of how to shape your character so as to point you towards happiness. The root of that word is ethos, and both of these words survive in English. E ethike, as I mentioned before, just like politike survives as politics, ethike survives as ethics, which is why this is the translation of this work, is the ethics. But as, as Sachs says, the, what it really means is, is how to build a character. The root again, ethos, which survives also in English, but it has ethics has acquired this kind of moral sense, like morality. It, uh, ethics and ethical is almost a synonym in our language for morals and morality. And, and so you could say, well, ethics is, is how to be a moral person. And that's true. That captures some of what Aristotle is doing. But as you're going to see, it's really a, a, a theoretical and practical manual on how to create a character, how to have a character. I know all about having a character. Uh, so um, uh, the next word is politeia. And I've already discussed this word in terms of um, the uh, Republic. <coughs> politeia is actually, an, the ea ending, is, uh, it, it survives in Latin as the ea, and, math, and, and in English, for that matter, is the ea ending, or the c ending, assi ending, like democratia is a democracy. Uh, but the politeia is the abstraction of the arrangement of citizens, the politos, the politoi. So this is the word that is translated as constitution or regime in uh, in Lord's, Lord's translation of the of the politics that we're using in this class. So, uh, but there are three English words that really sum up this idea of politeia. Uh, the constitution is one of them. So if you were describing our written constitution of the United States, you would say the politeia of the United States. Polity is the actual English survival of this word, politeia, uh, in English. It's actually a cognate word. And regime. Now, I discuss the origins of this in this paragraph, just to be, do this briefly. Regime. regime is a French word that comes from the Latin word rex, which is not the name of a dog. Rex is the Latin word for king. And the genitive and accusative grammatical forms, the older root of the word rex comes out as R-E-G-I-S, regis of the king, regem to the king, or the king. Um, and that reg uh, suffix uh, or root is what survives in regime. So a regime is the ruling thing in the city, the thing, that's, the thing that supplies order and rule to the city. Constitution is a Latin term that comes from the prefix cum, con, with or together. And stare, like institution, means to, to set something up, to stand it up. The Latin word stare means to stand. So a constitution is that thing that holds the political life of the city together. Now, you've also encountered this word because most Latin and then for uh, European and English translations of the Republic translate the name of that work as politeia, as republic. But the problem is republic has a certain different feel. It has a certain kind of constitution one that's popularly based through Republican institutions. So really, the, the literal translation of Republic, the work we just finished and worked through, is really Constitution. 
or regime or polity, the political order of the city. And Aristotle will spend a lot of time in book three of the politics defining that term. So uh, as I already suggested, political science as, as developed by Plato and Aristotle in the end of book four of the Republics and in book eight of the, of the Republic and in the politics of Aristotle is the science of analyzing and classifying political life according to what kind of regime or constitution a polis or a nation or city has. Um, politikos is the next term, which is the doer of that activity. Politi politos, citizen, is a member of the political community. O politikos is where our word politician comes from, but also politikos can mean politician. The people that run the power, that run the city and have power and responsibility. Politikos can be translated as politician, but in English that has kind of an unsavory uh, atmosphere, like the kinds of people that pre participate in presidential debates and political contests. The kind of images of a slimy, oily guy wanting to kiss your baby so that he gets your vote. Um, and But politikos is really the runner of the city, the people that have direct authority. Now, in a popular form of government, in a democracy or republic, or a, a constitution as Aristotle will define it, citizens can alternate with each other to become politikoi, politikos, politicians and statesmen. But strictly speaking, the politikos are the people that run the power. Citizens are members of the political community. Uh, statesmen, politicians are the ones who actually exercise political authority. As I've already suggested, some of you probably are aiming at being politikoi or politikai, which is the feminine version of that. So the next term that Aristotle will use in book three of the politics is politeoma, the uh, supreme body, the ruling body, the actual institutions that actually wield political power in any city. In a kingship, it's the single, the politeum with the ruling body is the king. In a tyranny, it's the tyrant. In an oligarchy, it's the wealthy aristocratic class. In an aristocracy, like in the best city in the Republic, the politeuma are the philosopher or philosophers that actually rule the city and so forth. In a democracy, a demokratia, the rule of the masses or the people, demos, people in Greek, um, the ruling body is the people itself. So, um, uh, so what the politeia, the constitution does, is create the ruling body that exercises political power. So just a couple of other quick terms that we'll become more familiar with. And actually, we've already encountered some of these in the regime analysis, the constitutional analysis of Book 8 of the Republic. Um, but in especially in Book 3, when Aristotle defines the constitution and lays out the six kinds of constitutions that there are, here are some terms. Basileos is the Greek word for king, and basileia is kingship. Um, aristokratia. The krasi ending, the kratea ending, comes from the Greek word kratein, which means to have power or authority. And therefore, kratea is power or authority or rule of. And as uh, we already talked about this in Book 8 of the Republic, um, uh, aristos, and by the way, this, this word you'll see later on in the ethics, arete is the Greek word for virtue. So we're, ver, our word virtue, virtu, uh, virtutis comes from Latin, it comes from vir, which means man. So virtue literally means the art of being a man. But in uh, Greek, arete means literally the virtue of perfecting a human being, which is what Aristotle defines in books one and two of the ethics. So the Greek word for virtue is arete, and the Greek word aristos means the best, the most virtuous. So aristokratia is the rule, was aristocracy is the rule of the best. Timokratea. Timos is the Greek word for honor or reputation. And as we already saw, Aristotle doesn't use this regime classification. As you'll see, this is in Platonic because of the Platonic grounding of political science in the different parts of the soul. More about that in a minute. So Timokratea is a democracy. Is, is, so oligarchia. Oligarchia. Oligarchy. Archi, uh, like archos, are, are, uh, comes from the Greek word to be the beginning, the, how, the founder of the original purposes of, and also rule of. is So the archi ending, as in oligarchy, um, uh, or artok, or ar artarchy, artarchy uh, is a synonym of karatea. So oligos, as we already saw with Plato's Republic in Book 8, <coughs> means oligos is the Greek word for few. 
But it, as you're going to see in both Platonic and Aristotelian analysis, oligos doesn't just refer to a few ruling people. It means wealthy, because in any society, the wealthy are the few. So oligarchy is literally the rule of the wealthy, with the rule of wealth. Demokratia, democracy. Demos is the Greek word for the masses or the body of the people. That word survives in demography, demo, demagogue, and so forth. Demagogos is the leader or misleader of the people. So demos, demokratia is the rule of the people. That's what democracy means. So, um, and on uh, the bottom of this key term, um, you'll see that I want to uh, distinguish. I'm going to make a difference between Aristotelian political science and Platonic political science. And let me just read that at the bottom of the page. So, and by the way, I noticed that my um, uh, the page division divided this um, uh, this uh, regime. So you're going to see Aristotle. Well, let me read this at the bottom. In the Republic, Plato in Book Eight discovers the kinds and decay of regimes which parallel the healthy unhealthy kinds of souls. Uh, Aristotle defines and introduces the concept of the regime constitution in Book Two and classifies in Book Three the politics. Six kinds of polity. Now, Aris, uh, Plato got his kinds of constitutions or polity or regimes from which part of the soul rules in the dominant uh, political social element of that city. Where does Aristotle get six? Why are there essentially six kinds of constitution or polity or regime in Aristotle? It's because two times three equals six. I know you didn't know that before today's lecture, but yes, it's true. Six, two times three is six. <laughs> yeah, I just drooled a little bit. You might want to back away from the screen. So what does that mean? Aristotle creates six kinds of polities, and if you turn the page, and this is what you'll see in book three of the politics, based on the number of individuals ruling and whether or not the rule of those individuals is for the common good, which he calls just, or for the good, the private good of the ruling element, which he calls unjust. So in some ways, as you're going to see, Aristotle has a psychology, just like Plato has a psychology, and Aristotle has a politics of political science. But Aristotle, in some ways, divorces his political science from his psychological science. So whereas Plato's political science really is based on his psychological science, um, Aristotle in some ways severs the two and creates an independent basis for uh, identifying the elements of and classifying the kinds of political regimes that cities have. So what are the odd alternatives in terms of number? You can either have one ruling, few ruling, or the many ruling, and just and unjust. So the rule, as we'll see in book three, the rule of the just one for the good of all is a kingship, Basileia, in which, based on virtue or excellence of the one ruler, and this is like this is like the philosopher ruling in book, um, uh, in books uh, five and so forth of the Republic. The rule of the, and by the way, you'll note we'll, we're we're going to spend more time on this when we unfold the politics in a couple of weeks. But note, uh, Aristotle also ranks the regimes. They go from on the one side, the just on one side, on the left side, and the unjust on the right side. And the corruption of the best of the good, because the rule of the one best virtue is kingship, the rule of the few best is aristocracy, and the rule of the many, polity or constitution, more about that, or the law, are also ranked. Kings, the rule of the best is ostensibly uh, the best regime, and then the corruption of the best is the worst. In other words, on the other side, the unjust side, it goes from worst to not so bad to the best of the bad. And you'll notice that democracy is on the bad side. It's on the unjust side. And so tyranny is the unjust rule of the one, which is the worst corruption of the unjust, the just rule of the one. Oligarchy, the rule of the wealthy few, is the corruption of aristocracy, which is the just rule of the best. And democracy, number, poverty, equality, and freedom. Uh, just as Plato says in Book 8, is where the masses rule for their own benefit. Now, why democracy is one of the bad regimes and unjust? But no, it's the best of the bad. So uh, Aristotle and Plato's judgment on democracy is complex. It's not what ours is. Ours thinks that democracy is best. But again, don't forget, our cave is modernity. So uh, you should just know that the word nomos, nomoi in law, means laws. And, and um, 
and uh, and is what the word for law, and uh, and 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 you'll see by the way, laws are what regimes produce. Um, it so happens to be also the ground of our the English word numismatist and numismatics. Nomos is also the word for coin because, of course, coin the value of a coin is established by law. Now, specific terms to the ethics, which Sachs talks about in his introduction. Arete is virtue. We've already talked about that. Aristos meaning the best. From agathos, agath agathos, which means good. Uh, and tomeson. Uh, in Sachs's introduction, he discusses the three little words. Um, uh, uh, habit, mean, and noble. And retranslates them for reasons we'll see. Um, but tomeson is the middle point. And as you're going to see, this is the foundation of Aristotle's discussion of, of what is virtue. It's the mean, the middle point between two extremes of vice. This is the key to Aristotelian moral theory and, as you'll see, also political theory. And this idea influenced profoundly the Muslim, Jewish, and Christian medieval effusions of uh, theological and moral teaching in Aquinas, in Maimonides, in the Jewish term, in al Rush. Uh, uh, in uh, the the Muslim world, this all all of these great Christian, Muslim, and Jewish medieval theological and moral teachings are essentially based upon this notion of the mean virtue is the mean uh, from uh, the ethics. Eudaimonia, a good good diamonds, good di demons is the we the good demonosity. I translated it. It means good soul or happiness. This is, and you're going to see, this is what Aristotle argues in the ethics is the purpose of human life is happiness. Um, and happiness is two kinds of ice cream. That's from uh, Your Good Man, Charlie Brown, the uh, Broadway musical based upon um, uh, the, the Peanuts character strips and Snoopy sings. Uh, and that's the theme song of the musical at the end is happiness. Happiness is two kinds of ice cream. Now you know it's two kinds of ice cream. I'm happy with one kind of ice cream and lots of it. Um, so uh, so what is happiness? As you're going to see, uh, this is true for Plato and it's true for Aristotle. Happiness is the condition of the perfection of the soul. Um, and, uh, and, um, and more about nature and perfection of the soul and all that. The Greek word ergon, which is the Greek word for work, and, and Sachs, uh, translates that he says one problem is is in prior translations that was function, and he says that's not a mistranslation if you say well what's the, what's the function of the stomach it's the work of the stomach, but you're going to see that he translates it as work in action or the work of, uh, um, and and for reasons that we'll see as we unfold his teaching, and ergea n means in in Greek just like in in Latin means in, um, and ergea means work or or put to work. The being at work is how Sachs translates it. Now, that's an important term in Aristotelian. Energia is like actuality, actual things existing or brought into being in motion. Activity, almost, is is the generic word for energia. Um, but as you're going to see, the Aristotelian th doctrine of nature uh, um, uh, rests upon the distinction between potential and actual. More about that in a minute. Hexis is often translated as habit. Sax traps it as disposition because there's an irony in Aristotelian moral thinking that the way you shape your character is you create your character through shaping your habits. But doesn't habit mean something unconscious when you're something's habitual? It means like when you learn to drive, first you have to like pay attention to everything, but after you drive for a while, you pay attention to nothing, which is why there are so many accidents. So there's an irony in translating, and this is Sax as we'll see. That's why he translates this as disposition. He wants a more active sense that what what you're doing when you're being an ethical character, when you're shaping your character, is like the, an archer actively aiming for that target between two means. He he doesn't like translate. Although hexis is often translated as habit, and you could say one way of distinguishing between a moral and immoral person is a moral person has cultivated good habits and cultivates good habits in his or her children. So habits not a mistranslation. But the reason that, that ha Sachs has trouble with it is because he wants a more active sense of what you're doing when you're fashioning your character. And finally, kalos, beautiful. Uh, tokalon, the beautiful, the noble. Uh, in most translations of Aristotle's uh, ethics, 
it's translated as the noble or the fine. Uh, sex doesn't think that's quite, because this is just the regular Greek word for beautiful. Uh, so as in some ways, the core of Aristotelian ethical theory is to create a beautiful character, one not ugly, one that's worth looking at, one that generates self-esteem when you look at your own character. More about this when he turned into the psychology of Aristotle's virtue uh, uh, on Monday and Tuesday's lecture, Wednesday's lecture. So as you're going to see, it's also in some ways the aim of Aristotle's political teaching is to create a beautiful political order. Well, what does beauty mean? Um, uh, Plato talks about in Book Six of the good being the idea of the good being both true and beautiful. Uh, and do you remember that's when he says "hush" to Glaucon? Oh, you know I mean it's pleasure? No, it's not pleasure, you doorknob. Um, so anyway, uh, we will come back to these terms because they are key to understanding. In the same way that it would be like this, like. To understand modern chemistry, you have to understand the periodical table of the elements. These key terms in Greek, in, in Aristotelian, and in some ways Platonic, ethical, and political theory are, are essential to grasping the overall science that these authors erect. So, um, in Roman numeral three, uh, we may not finish this material. We may have to finish it up on Wednesday and start book one and two, but that's okay. This is deep stuff, uh, and it's it's good for you to know it. So, er, so Aristotle's universe and the human being in it. As I was uh, uh, working through this material to put this lecture together, and also, in some ways, as I'm used to laying out the ethics and the politics of Aristotle, it, it would be fair to say that perhaps this is the best way to describe it. Uh, Aristotle is laying out in front of you in the ethics and the politics the, the relevant landscape of human life that you need to pay attention to in order to live a human life most consciously and a political life most effectively. And you'll see in the ethics, I'm going to argue this, that in book one, he's laying out the, the landscape of the things that people want in life, the things that make them happy. Uh, and in book two, he kind of does what Plato does in book four of the Republic. He lays out the psychological landscape. So to be a good human being, you have to know what human life is about. And he's going to talk about the different ends or purposes that people live for, that they identify with happiness in book one. Uh, as the end or purpose of human life. And in uh, and in book two, he's going to talk about the soul too. But you'll see he gives a slightly different account of the soul than Plato does. And uh, and I think that's because he Plato or Aristotle thinks that in order to direct human beings' attention to what's going on inside of them, their internal landscape, as opposed to the external landscape of the goods that human life is arranged for, money, power, reputation, bodily pleasure, wisdom. There are different things that people aim their lives at, and that's the landscape of human action, what I call the external landscape when we turn to book one. In book two, he's turning to the internal landscape. What do you need to know about what's happening inside of you in order to master what's happening inside of you and point yourself towards moral virtue and happiness? Well, what I'm doing in this cone, if you, so you should have both this in, in, in front of uh, uh, view is Aristotle's trying to say what the ultimate landscape is, the cosmological landscape. And you're going to see it looks like, in some ways, resembles the divided line that Plato talks about in the Republic, but it's a, it's a slightly different conception of the universe and a different way of making human beings see what's around them in terms of uh, the natural world in such a way so that in seeing the landscape of the natural world, we can see how to order the landscape of human ends and purposes and also where the internal landscape of human psychology uh, uh, rests in the structure of the universe. Now, um, first, nature. Uh, so this is Roman numeral 3a. Uh, or the back up. Na Aristotle's universe and human being in it. Nature, potential actuality, causality, motion, the change of state of something from potential to actual. That's... And in the politics, both in the ethics and the politics, Aristotle does define, although, again, you find his fuller account of the natural universe, the cosmos, the entire world, in other works like the metaphysics and the physics and that kind of stuff. But um, uh, but what is nature? What What is the nature of a thing and what is nature as its whole? And you're going to see that that both what the what something's nature is, is what it is in particular, what Plato calls the idea of something or the form of something. And, but it turns out, not only does each thing created by nature have a nature, 
and and what he, as you'll see in the politics, what he defines nature is is what a thing is when it's process of birth or growth because uh, the word physique, fusein, fuein, is to grow. So physique, which we translate as physics, is actually Aristotle's word for nature. And that means what something grows into. So what a thing's nature is, its individual nature, whether it's an acorn or an oak tree. So literally, when you look at an acorn, this is the, the image that people use as the example all the time. You, you don't you see a, a, an acorn the way a squirrel does. And like that, that thing in, in Ice Age that wants the acorn. You see it as something to eat. But an acorn is a potential oak tree. A squirrel doesn't know that, but human beings do know because human beings have a unique capacity to see the nature of something and the nature of the whole universe. So uh, his definition of what nature is, is is when it's, now I say the process of birth and growth. That's because as I, in my uh, uh, American government, American political thought and other uh, courses in modern political theory, nature, what the word nature is a Latin word, natura. It comes, the things that are born, because it comes from the Latin word nascor, which is the past participle of which is natus, which means a born thing. So, um, uh, so what nature? So nature, the the Latin word for nature is natura. The Latin, the Greek word for nature is physics, physike. The Greek word for nature comes from growth. The uh, the Latin word for nature comes from birth, birth or growth. Birth or growth are natural processes. And what that process is, Aristotle says, is what a thing is when its process of growth or development is completed. Now, what growth and development is, is the change from potential into actual. That's Aristotle's understanding of change and nature uh, and, and motion. What motion and change is in Aristotle's universe is the transformation for potential, what something is potential, to what it is in actuality, and ergea, at work. And um, uh, so uh, th this is why Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and Cicero are all in the same universe, essentially, because uh, uh, because knowing nature, knowing not only what human nature is and what a human being grows into when unimpeded or aided, I should say, when aided by culture and politics, but sometimes perverted by culture and politics. Um, uh, so uh, uh, is for, to live a human life, you have to know what the nature of a human being is. To know what the nature of a human being is, you have to know what nature is, Na the nature of nature as a whole. And again, as you'll see, and that's what the cone business is, is that's what Aristotle argues, is that the universe that we live in isn't just the result of blind chance. There is an order, and that not only does individual parts of it, like, like acorns and puppies and uh, undergraduates grow into something else, not only do acorns, puppies, and undergraduates, ha ha human beings have a nature, but nature has a nature. And and again, I do think that to understand his ethical and political science, you have to see that universe. And again, as I said earlier, uh, this image of the cone, as we'll work through it, we may have to wait until Monday for that. I don't know. We'll see. Um, uh, 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 this is, I think, the best way to understand uh, the arrangement of the universe with us in it. That provides objective guidance for who and what we are individually, personally, culturally, and politically. Now, uh, I think what we'll have time to discuss is, um, in just a couple of minutes, is let me lay out, when I say um, uh, motion is a change of state from potential to actual, Aristotle argues there are four kinds of natural causes that change things and bring things into being. And here's what we'll actually finish with, and then we'll just pick up with the rest of this stuff on Monday. So hold on to that cone for Monday. Um, is, um, is Aristotle argues there are four kinds of causes that bring things into being, causes and effects. The effect of something when it's perfected nature is when its potentials are all brought into being. So what are the four causes? Uh, one is, and they are material, formal, efficient, and final. What that means is the material cause of something is what something is made of. Like this table is, God knows what this table is made out of. It's not actually wood. But in the same way that like a wooden chair, wood is the material cause of the chair. In a concrete chair, concrete is the material cause of the chair. The formal cause of something is blueprint or shape. So uh, obviously this is borrowed from you in art. That is to say, if you want to build a chair, you have to have an image, a form of what a chair is and does. You have to make it out of material. And you can't make like material, you can't make a chair out of toothpicks because that won't work because that won't support the material cause of that thing won't support uh, the the purpose and the form of it. 
And so there's an efficient cause, the actual force that brings something into being. And then the final cause is the purpose or telos, the gain, aim or goal of something, the reason that something exists. So if you're a chair maker, your, your final cause of a chair is the purpose for which it brings it, which is to sit on. The formal cause is the design of the chair that enables the end or purpose to occur. Uh, the material cause is what it's made out of. And ultimately, the, the efficient cause is, is the actual maker of the chair. Aristotle argues these four kinds of causal forces are, are shot through the entire universe. Now, of course, there's one big difference between the ancient view of the universe and the modern view of the universe. Because modern science tells us that natural motion is, is, is matter in motion, but it argues there's no such thing as purpose or end or, 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 or completion. Aristotle argues there are, and that to understand the nature of the thing, you have to understand how these four causes of each natural thing, whether it's a human being, whether it's a, a chair, an artificial thing, whether it's a tree, and whether it's a city, or even an individual human character, how the four causes describe what the nature of this thing is and how to bring it into being. So uh, there's an introduction to Aristotelian natural theory. We'll pick up with a cone on Monday. And then um, I have some imp important comments to make about the nature of writing between Plato and Aristotle. And then we'll actually begin our, treat our in investigation in books one and two of the ethics on Monday. Have a nice weekend.